Welcome to No Better Death, the podcast that knows while you can die no better death than your own, that doesn't mean we can't take a look for the unusual and the noteworthy in the deaths of others. Each episode, we'll take an in-depth look at some out-of-the-ordinary deaths and the events surrounding them. This show will contain explicit language and graphic details. I'm your host, Sick Grayson. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and those who refuse to conform to the binary ones and zeros humans choose to define themselves as. It is I, Sickleford Pennyworth Grayson III, back in your ear holes for another episode. The theme this week was going to be Colorado love, but my wife said that was kind of whack, so I changed it to Colorful Colorado. Why? Because I've lived here for about three and a half years, and I love it. Even before I moved here, I would make a trip at least once a month to Colorado from Nebraska to go to concerts or shopping, take the kids somewhere, just to do anything besides sit at home and wish I didn't live in Nebraska. So I thought I'd dedicate an episode to a couple stories from, as the signs at the borders say, colorful Colorado. Uh, Before we get into the stories, uh, how's it going, guys? What have you been up to? Um... Things have been pretty busy around the Grayson household, as usual. Uh, My daughter and I went to see Nine Inch Nails at Red Rocks last week. That was a blast. Uh, Third time seeing Nine Inch Nails for me. First time for my daughter. Uh, She loved it. Nothing cooler than seeing an 11-year-old screaming the lyrics to head like a hole at the top of her lungs. So, Uh, Yeah, Trent and company always put on a good show. They played Perfect Drug live for the first time ever, so it was really cool to get to see that. It uh, sounds like they're doing something special at each show this tour, so uh, if you're a Nine Inch Nails fan and you don't have tickets yet, go get them. And uh, I am, so yeah, my daughter was, she went with me Tuesday to Nine Inch Nails. She's out till two in the morning. Then on Saturday night, went to an 18,000 person amphitheater to see Bad Religion, Pennywise, and Rancid. Like, what 11-year-old has that life? My kids do more in six months than my family did during my entire childhood. They're spoiled, I say. Spoiled. Um, I had to withdraw from school. Uh, Pell Grant ran out, leaving me holding the bag for, like, another five grand before I can finish my bachelor's degree, and I don't really have it right now, so I put that on hold for the moment. Uh, I'm only three classes and a capstone project away from graduating, but just not a good time for my Pell Grant to run out. Uh, But it gives me more time to focus on the show, so maybe I can take the time I was using for school and put it toward the show, kind of beef this thing up, see what happens. Um, Oh, speaking to Gary Newman in the last episode, he's back in Denver uh, this Friday, September 28th, so I guess that's where I'll be that night. Uh, if anyone in Denver happens to listen to this thing, uh, go, you know, 25 bucks at Fashion Nation, go get your ticket, go check out Gary Newman. Uh, in show-related news, uh, No Better Death officially has a website. Instead of trying to remember the Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you can go to nobetterdeath.info. That is nobetterdeath.info for all the info on No Better Death. Uh, That's going to be the main podcast site. You can subscribe to the RSS feed, listen to the show, find links to all of our social media stuff, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's all right there on the website. Um, It's pretty basic, but it tells you what you need to know about the show. So go check it out. News stories, news from the week. What did we have? A shooting at Rite Aid and uh, a shooting at a software company in Wisconsin. Shootings, shootings, shootings. Um, You know, I don't really mention shootings on the show. I'm not trying to gloss over events like that. You know, unfortunately, everyday shootings, there's not much of a story, at least not for entertainment purposes. I mean, that's, it's just tragedy. It's, I mean, I I try to find stories that are old enough or maybe, you know, unusual enough that we, we could get a joke or two out of it. Or use it just, you know, for entertainment. But the shootings, I just, they're not. It's not what this show is about, you know. Um, Some asshole gets angry about their life, takes a gun to work or to to the store and tries to shoot people. Because that was a more logical answer than, than what? Accepting the fact that he or she is responsible for their own choices and trying to figure out how to improve themselves. And take their life in a better direction. That's, somehow that never 
occurs to them is just the most logical solution to their problems is to go shoot up a fucking Walmart because they got picked last for Red Rover in the fourth grade. I mean, it to me, it really kind of boils down to that. It's just people getting mad and taking out their anger on others. Like that lady that shot up the YouTube headquarters. She was mad because she wasn't getting as many views, so her videos didn't make as much money. Her answer to the problem was to go shoot the people that work at YouTube instead of uh, what, what do most of us do when we need more money. We get a fucking job. When I got sick of being broke, making minimum wage, flipping burgers, I didn't go to Sonic and shoot everybody. I got off my ass, got my associates, and went to work for the government. You know, and the media always tries to play it on this angle of, oh, what does it say about society and our place in the world and the crumbling moral infrastructure of blah, blah, blah. That Nothing to do with it. There's seven and a half billion people on this planet and 7.499999 billion of us don't go shoot up a place because we're pissed off. Some people are just fucked. Sometimes a person is damaged. It's that simple. They are the exception, not the rule. It doesn't say anything about anything other than every now and then a person's operating system didn't install properly. Their drivers didn't get updated to the most recent version, and they're using one that was designed during a time when putting heads on spikes kept your enemies at bay long enough for you to take a shit without getting your, your throat slit. It's sad. It's unfortunate. It's tragic. But the people perpetrating these atrocities are not special. They are not a story, and I refuse to immortalize them by turning them into a story. But this, this is a story. Uh, it happened in Europe. A 53-year-old female organ donor with no known metal con- uh, Can I talk today? Talk much? A 53-year-old female organ donor with no known medical conditions died from a stroke in 2007 and her lungs, kidneys, heart, and liver were harvested and given to five people who really needed the organs. So, you know, it's a, a good story so far. I mean, it's sad. A lady dies from a stroke at 53. That's, you know, with modern medicine, 53 is young. You know, I, I'm not going to say anything as lame as, like, 50 is the new 40, but we're doing good compared to past generations. Um... 53 is young, but they were able to take her organs and save five people who would have been dead otherwise. Until 16 months later, uh, the patient who received the lung was admitted to the hospital with transplant dysfunctions, at which point breast cancer cells were detected in her lymph nodes. DNA analysis showed that the, the cancer originated in the donor, not the recipient. See, organs and organ donors undergo a lot of tests to make sure the organs can be donated, and this donor was no different. They ran the test, everything came back clean, and doctors are saying at the time of donation there was no sign of cancer or anything else being wrong with this woman and cleared her to for organ donation. Um, so the best conclusion they can come up with is that the cancer cells were so young they were undetectable by their tests, so they kind of slipped under the radar, got into these new patients that, that they were transplanted into, and spread throughout their body. Uh, those who received the lung, liver, and left kidney died when the cancer spread to other parts of their body. The liver recipient lived the longest, about seven years after the transplant. Uh, the patient who received the right kidney underwent treatment that included removing the donated kidney and was able to survive the cancer. Uh, the heart patient died five months after the transplant from sepsis, unrelated to cancer, so it, it was either an infection from the transplant or her body was rejecting the organ, and she didn't even make it long enough to, to get cancer. Um, and it is known that cancer can spread from transplanted organs, but something like this has never happened. It, it's unprecedented for a few reasons. One, you know, no cancer was detected at the time of donation. Uh, two, it was breast cancer that spread, and that hasn't been recorded in any kind of transplant. They've never seen breast cancer spread from a transplanted organ into the new donor, or the, the new patient, the new owner, sorry. Uh, and it happened with not one, but four people. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And my wife uh, brought up a good point I didn't even think of when I was telling her this story. How messed up is this really for the people that got the donated organs? I mean, imagine you're told you're going to die if you don't get a new liver. You go through all the emotional distress of processing that, the rage, the sadness, the uncertainty. 
getting ready to pack your life up and give it away to whoever you're leaving behind and coming to terms with death. But then, just in time, you get that liver you need. Now you have to deal with surgery and recovery and the stress of that whole process. It takes you months to get back on your feet. And finally, finally you're feeling good. Things are working the way they're supposed to. You've got a new lease on life just to find out that now you're dying from something worse than what you had to begin with. Now you have incurable cancer. You try to go through cancer treatment, and, and that is a shit show, man. Anyone who's ever had cancer or a loved one with cancer knows how bad it is. Uh, there's been a lot of people in my family die from cancer, and it's, it's no good watching them go through treatment. And then after, after needing an organ, getting the organ, going through the surgeries, after the cancer treatment, when you find out your organ's bad, you're going to die anyway. I mean, I, I can't even find the words to describe how messed up that is. And I, I can't pretend to ever understand what going through something like that would be like. Uh, ultimately, the doctors think that the immunosuppressant drugs the patients had to take, the, the pills to keep their bodies from rejecting the organs are what allowed the cancer to thrive. It basically shuts down your immune system and anything that gets into your body has the potential to kill you. Anything from, I mean, cold to AIDS to pneumonia, whatever. Uh, In this case, it was cancer. Uh, What else? Uh, I saw this story in the news. Uh, September 13th, a series of gas line explosions ripped through Boston, like just houses that had gas service caught on fire or exploded Uh, and at the time they didn't know why but it was all in one day just boom 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 Uh, 39 houses caught fire and or exploded due to failing gas line infrastructure in the Boston area and I always say gas lines are a ticking time bomb at some point something is going to happen to blow up a house you're piping an explosive gas into a confined space what do you think is going to happen you know and, and a It looks like in Boston, the lines aren't maintained as well as they should be. And something just gave that day, sparking dozens of fires. Uh, Only one person was killed. It could have been way worse. Could have had multiple deaths in each home. But luckily, only one death here. The weird part is, is this guy wasn't in any of those 39 houses. Uh, Lionel Rondon, age 18, got his license that day. Do you remember how stoked you were when you got your license? It was one of the greatest days of your life, right? You you were nervous. You went in. You took the test the whole time. You think you're driving like a maniac. You you don't really know how you're doing until it's all over with. They tell you 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 pass. You get your license. You you went home. You called your friends. Hey, guys, I got my license. What do you want to do tonight? I'm driving. Let's go. You get in the car, and you're driving along, and a fucking chimney falls onto your car out of nowhere and kills you. Yeah, that last part didn't happen to, uh, as far as I know, anyone except Lionel Rondon. Uh, Happened to be driving past one of the homes as it exploded. The chimney shot up in the air and across the yard, lands on his car and killed him. I mean, that's, that's weird enough that it could get an entire episode here if it wasn't I mean, that, that's just pretty much the story. There's really no other details to, to tell. The The pipe system started failing around Boston. Some houses blew up, and this guy's car was in front of one of those houses. It's just, you never think when you wake up in the morning, oh, I hope I don't get crushed by a flying chimney today. Uh, so, you know, thoughts and well wishes to his family. Obviously, on this show, uh, if I ever sound like I'm making fun of something, I, I'm not. I mean, this this is a messed up way to go. An 18-year-old who was out celebrating what he thought would be one of, one of the best days of his life, something he'd always remember, and then just snuffed out by a flying chimney. It's a, a weird way to go. Uh, update on the Amber Geiger case. Uh, I know it's been a while since the last episode, so this has probably been covered on a dozen other podcasts by now. Uh, but apparently the investigators are trying to smear the victim's name. Instead of looking into why the cop did what she did, they're trying to make him look bad, tearing his apartment apart, looking for signs that he was a criminal, and all they found was 10 grams of weed. As if that changes the dynamic of what happened. This man was in his home, minding his own business, as far as we can tell. He's he's never heard a fly, and then someone came into his house and murdered him. 
He wasn't committing a crime at the time, so what if he had a little bit of weed? The amount he had was misdemeanor, bordering on petty offense. Instead of saying, hey, this white girl did something wrong, they're looking for any reason they can find to paint the black man as a monster so the public will be more okay with her having murdered him. You know, it's cops looking out for cops instead of cops looking out for the citizens they promised to, to protect when they joined the force. But I did see an update today, and that bitch is fired. So... We'll see how it goes. But yeah, as of right now, she does not have a job and she is still on the hook for manslaughter. It hasn't gone to trial yet. They haven't said when it's going to trial. Uh, So I'll keep you updated on it. Uh, But as of right now, they're trying to make him look bad, even though he's the victim and she doesn't have a job. That's the latest on the Amber Geiger case. All right. So on to the stories for this week. Uh, Like I said, I've got two of them. Uh, Both are Colorado-based stories. Um, And for this first one, I I just want to preface this by saying, God, am I stuttering a lot today? I'd like to tell you a star. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what my deal is today. Um, I try to keep the show away from the topic of serial killers. You know, there's 500 podcasts out there about serial killers to choose from. And we all know that if you want to hear a show about serial killers, you go listen to the last podcast on the left. You know, those guys have the serial killer game on lock, and I wouldn't even dream of trying to compete. Uh, But as this episode is about Colorado, uh, I wanted to talk about Vincent Darnell Groves, Colorado's most prolific serial killer. Bum, bum, bum. Also, I usually write up my own points, my own article about whatever the story is. I read through as many articles as I can find and type up basically like a book report for each episode and each story. Uh, But for the two stories today, I found fairly detailed articles that were already written. So I'm going to read those to you with proper credit given. Um, the, you know, these were way better sources than anything I found for the first three episodes. I mean, I usually, I think on the first two, I had maybe 10, 15 pages of notes and those episodes turned out to be really short. This one, I've got about 25 pages of notes for today's episode. So hopefully this one will turn out to be a little bit longer. Yeah. water from the 7-Eleven water dispenser with Mio Berry Energy Mix squirted in. I drink this all day, every day, and I will probably die before I turn 45 for just constantly sucking down caffeine and artificial sweeteners. But, I mean, it's healthier than my old lifestyle of, like, you know, staying up for three days on ecstasy and acid so this can't be that unhealthy right all right uh, the source for this first story about vincent groves is from 5280 uh, it's a local denver magazine uh, the article is titled chasing a ghost and was written by robert sanchez in 2012 Uh, The story is written in a way that it kind of jumps around, like it brings you in in what was present day when it was written, like 2010 to 2012, but then it jumps back in time to tell you about Grove's crimes. Uh, So I'll try to tell this in a way that's not too confusing, but if you ever catch yourself uh, like, oh, wait, where are we at in this story? Just remember, we're, we're jumping from like 2010 back to the late 80s and back again. But, uh, this article is awesome. Props to Robert Sanchez. This I can't tell if he wrote an article for a magazine or is trying to pitch a movie script. This thing is detailed in ways that aren't even possible for this guy to have been there, but it, it is so great. Here we go. For 33 years, no one had been able to solve the homicides of three women, all of who had been assaulted and killed in the same grisly manner just months apart. When detectives from the Denver Police Department's cold case unit recently reopened the investigations, they not only identified the murderer, but they also found one of the most brutal serial killers in Colorado history. On an early morning in May 2010, 
My loose yearling made his lunch, kissed his wife goodbye for the day, and reported to the second floor at Denver Police Headquarters where he worked as a detective in the cold case unit. At 41 years old, Yearling was built like a 1970s linebacker, slightly doughy in the middle with large features and a round, clean-shaven head that sprouted from a thick neck and broad, sloping shoulders. He had a neatly trimmed mustache and wore a white dress shirt, a tie, and a dark blue blazer, which he removed and hung on a coat rack in his cubicle. His black dress shoes were scuffed on the backs of the soles. Yearling put his lunch in the refrigerator and sat down at his desk, which was flanked on three sides by investigative binders, photos of his two children, and superhero action figures his young son Michael had given him as gifts over the years. The Incredible Hulk, dressed in a gangster's trench coat and holding a Thompson submachine gun, was on Yearling's left. The detective turned on his desktop computer and followed up on one of the dozen or so unsolved cases to which he'd been assigned. The vast majority were homicides and sexual assaults. The smell of stale coffee lingered near an open door where he worked. How vivid is that? Uh, what was it? Richard Sanchez isn't just telling you the news. He's not just giving you the rundown. He's painting a picture. He is pitching a movie script. He is making this jump off the page. How does he know what this guy wore to work that day? He wasn't there. And this guy couldn't have told him what he would. Do you remember what you, this article was written two years, probably about two and a half years after where it comes in at May 2010. Do you know what you wore to work two years ago? I don't know what I wore to work two days ago. Uh, I could tell you jeans and probably some sort of long sleeve shirt. That's as close as you're getting. I don't know what color shirt I had on. I, I don't know where I hung my coat when I got to work. Like, ugh. this guy, mm, he's making some stuff up. But I'm buying it. I'm buying it. I know logically he wasn't there, and this guy didn't remember what he was wearing that day, and that's fine, because they're, they're selling me on the story, man. As Yearling began his morning, Sergeant Anthony Parisi stopped at his desk with two files, each at least five inches thick. He was holding Yearling's newest assignments. Both victims were young black females, and the two had been raped and strangled just seven months apart. The first case involved a 25-year-old named Emma Jennifer, an employee of Warner Brothers Distribution who was found raped and strangled to death on March 26, 1979, in the bathtub of a rented apartment in Cherry Creek. Police found a radio in the tub, which made it appear as if Jennifer had electrocuted herself. When police searched the house, they found a blue nightgown neatly spread across her bed. Several glasses of water were in the sink. The living room television was on. The front door safety chain was dangling. Jennifer's on and off boyfriend, who went by the nickname Hook, had been a suspect. But 31 years later, there had never been enough evidence for an arrest. The second case belonged to Peggy Cuff, a 20-year-old who disappeared after her shift at a collections agency in Denver. Her partially nude body was discovered November 3, 1979, five miles from her office in an alley about nine blocks from the University of Denver campus. The victim had been raped and strangled. The crime scene photographs in Cuff's file were too difficult to look at. Her body crumpled on the asphalt, was face down just a few feet from a tangle of weeds. Her blue corduroy pants were nearly torn from her body. As Yearling studied the photos, he couldn't escape the thought that it looked as if she'd been discarded like a bag of garbage. Parisi already knew the murders were the work of one man. As the sergeant explained to Yearling, post-mortem kits had been saved in the police department's evidence storage unit in the building's basement. The kits were small, sealed cardboard canisters and included blood and hair samples, plus swabs taken from the victim's vaginal areas. In the past few months, suspect DNA had been called from both kits. The DNA matched. The idea of a quick clearance on two decades old murders appealed to Yearling, who'd seen many cases go cold for lack of witnesses or evidence. Crimes buried in a grave of musty paperwork and dead end leads. He reviewed the files, then packed them up. Now it was his job to find the murderer. In 1978, Vincent Groves was a 24-year-old who lived in relative obscurity in Denver, where he worked as an electrician at the Gates Rubber Company near downtown. 
He was six feet, five inches tall, with light brown skin and an easy, confident gait. He'd come from a middle-class family in Wheat Ridge, the oldest of three sons born to a postal worker father and a teacher mother. They lived in a brick home on a gently sloping corner lot that overlooked a neighborhood of ranch-style houses and slowly maturing shade trees. Groves had been a prom king finalist in high school, a member of the student council, and a basketball player on a team that included future NFL player Dave Logan. Shortly after Wheat Ridge High School lost the 1972 state championship, Groves enrolled at Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where he played basketball for two years. He dropped out in 1974 and returned to Colorado, where he cared for his elderly grandmother, worked, and spent time with his parents. Although he didn't consider himself overly religious, he, of he often attended the Baptist church where his father was a deacon and his mother played the organ. Since leaving college, Groves also lived a secret life. When he was away from his family, he drank at a Denver lounge called the New Yorker. Friends began to think he was an alcoholic. At night, he cruised a five-mile strip of East Colfax Avenue, a road connecting the Denver-Aurora border notorious for its pay-by-the-hour motels and easy access to drugs. Among his closest acquaintances were pimps and prostitutes, whom Groves often supplied with cocaine. He befriended one prostitute, a 17-year-old named Jeanette Baca, and became her pimp. On June 11, 1978, Baca's nude body was found dumped a half-mile from a Jefferson County park. Police interviewed Groves, but charges were never filed. Less than a year later, Groves moved in with 21-year-old Norma Jean Halford. On August 24, 1979, a Colorado State Trooper discovered Halford's empty vehicle parked along a mountainous road outside Georgetown. The woman's body was never found. Uh, to give you a little context here, when they say he, cru he cruised a five-mile strip of East Colfax, uh, Colfax is kind of considered a somewhat ghetto area, uh, definitely a lot cleaner now than it used to be. Uh, but back in the, you know, the late seventies and eighty, Colfax was the place you didn't want to be unless you were looking for something you're not supposed to have. I mean, and you can still buy drugs and pick up a prostitute on Colfax. Like it's not gone. I mean, I, I've been propositioned on Colfax. My wife has been offered drugs on Colfax, uh, you can walk down it now without really having to worry about getting stabbed for the most part, but we're talking 1979. This is the area of town this guy was in. And just based on the fact that he's there kind of means he's looking to get into something that's not so good. Groves eventually moved to a house in Denver and continued pushing cocaine, heroin, and marijuana. He snorted lines of Coke while he played poker with friends. Among them, a petite, attractive bank employee with short hair named Jeanette Hill. The pair had met at church years earlier, but only recently had they fallen in love. Hill didn't seem to care what Groves was doing in his spare time, or perhaps she didn't know. Groves could have been forgiven for thinking he'd found the perfect woman. The two were soon living together in a second-floor apartment on Denver's Pearl Street. By then, Groves had left Gates Rubber and found janitorial work throughout the city. The freedom allowed him to come and go as he pleased, and by early 1981, it was becoming more difficult for Hill to ignore her boyfriend's behavior. He often disappeared for days at a time. Life wasn't much better when he was around. One night, just before their wedding on March 23, 1981, someone broke a window to their apartment and left a gun on the sill. It was clearly a threat, perhaps from someone Groves had crossed on the street. Groves panicked and told Hill to pack her clothes. They were moving, right now. The pair drove across town in the middle of the night and moved into his parents' home in Wheat Ridge. A few weeks later, on their wedding night, Hill slept while her new husband got high. Of the eight or nine detectives in Denver's cold case unit, perhaps none relished the hunt more than Milo's yearling. He'd been a fast riser through other police units, particularly because of his investigations into sexual assaults, where he used DNA to help solve some of Denver's most appalling cases. In 2005, he helped find a forensic link to Brent Brents, a serial rapist who terrorized the city and whose parents obviously didn't love him or they wouldn't have named him Brent Brents. Fewer than three years later, Yearling tied a series of sexual assaults to Michael Lolas, who'd attacked nine women in Denver and Arapahoe County. 
After more than a decade on the police force, working his way from car number 613 patrolling the West Denver neighborhood where he'd lived as a toddler to his job now, Yearling was often reminded of what his mother once said to him. He was meant to be a light in the darkness. Before he'd leave for work in the morning, his children told him to catch the bad guys. Like the fictional superheroes on his desk, Yearling knew he was made to protect others. There seemed to be a destiny to his work. Shortly after Yearling joined the police department, his wife Shelly gave him a gold necklace with the Superman emblem attached to it. The golden S hung just above his heart, and he wore it to work every day. Richard Sanchez, come on, man, you're killing me. You're, you're giving us the details. You're giving us the feels. You're building a backstory. This is, I feel like I'm watching uh, Unbreakable or something. Uh, yeah. I mean, he had a bald head and a mustache, and he was built like a linebacker, and he was a light in the darkness. I mean, does this guy turn into Batman at some point in this story? I'm At this point, I almost expect it. Like, at the end of this story, he's going to tear his shirt open and have a superhero costume under there, and they're like, oh, we knew it was you. Oh. With the suspect DNA match from Peggy Cuff's and Emma Jennifer's postmortem kits already recorded, authorities began a search for a forensic unknown in the federally operated Combined DNA Index System, aka CODIS, which was created in the mid-1990s as a collection site for the DNA profiles of convicted felons across the country. While forensic scientists had often used biological markers such as blood groups to help identify suspects, the advent of DNA typing in the 1980s produced something far deeper, a very unique biological code that police could use to mine for leads. By this time, CODIS had millions of DNA profiles. Yearling and Parisi waited for a suspect's name, but it never came. Yearling couldn't understand why a DNA record didn't exist in CODIS. From studying serial rapists for years, he knew most of them eventually slipped up and got caught. Yearling hypothesized that maybe the suspect had been in the military and was stationed overseas, thereby making himself ineligible for inclusion in the database. Or maybe the man died before CODIS began collecting DNA profiles. Had he simply stopped raping and killing? That seemed unlikely. Yearling switched to another lead, Jennifer's boyfriend, Hook. Yearling poured over hundreds of pages. He learned Hook drank heavily and had trouble keeping a job. Hook could become violent when he was drunk. Jennifer's friends told investigators in 1979 that she had been so frightened of him, she gave his address and phone number to a female friend. If anything happened to her, Jennifer explained to the woman, police needed to find Hook. When investigators first interviewed him, the man was 29. He was six feet tall and had a medium build. He belonged to a motorcycle gang. About two weeks after Jennifer's murder, he failed a polygraph test. Yearling held the examiner's report in his hands. Near the bottom of the typed out paper were the words, subject not cleared. Something confounded Yearling about this new suspect though. If Hook had murdered Jennifer and Peggy Cuff given the DNA match, there was nothing in his criminal record that would have led anyone to believe he had committed the two murders. Yearling had learned much during his time on the police force, including the fact that most rapists and murderers didn't begin with rapes and murders. Most often, there was a clear pattern that eventually led to something big, maybe arson or a series of felony assaults. Studying Hook's record, Yearling saw only DUIs, simple assaults, disturbing the peace, and drinking in public. So on paper, it looked like this guy just got drunk and started a little shit and then tried to drive home. No, nothing major, nothing indicating that whoever this Hook guy was, which of course, they're, they're saying that it was Groves. They just haven't connected it at this point. Uh, but nothing really, nothing on his record to indicate he was any kind of real danger. On the spectrum of criminal activity, these weren't much more than stupid mistakes. Could Hook have killed his girlfriend in a fit of rage? Maybe. Would he then have sought out a stranger to rape and strangle? Probably not. Yearling drove past the brick house where Jennifer's body was found. He stopped in the alley where Cuff was dumped near a worn garage. None of it made sense. Yearling periodically ran Hook's name through the National Crime Information Center database, and in spring of 2011, 
Roughly a year after taking on the cases, he finally got a hit. Hook had been arrested on a felony charge in Aurora. A year earlier, Colorado became the 19th state to adopt Katie's Law, named after a New Mexico woman who'd been raped and murdered in 2003, which required a DNA sample from anyone who'd been the subject of a felony arrest rather than a felony conviction. Hook's DNA profile would be uploaded to the DNA database in six weeks. Yearling's boss, Anthony Parisi, circled the date on the calendar on his office wall. On June 23, 2011, he checked the database. Hook didn't match. Yearling viewed the never-ending streams of cold cases on his desk as if they were broken spider webs. Each was dangling by a few precious threads, and each thread was part of a complicated tapestry he had to connect, one fragile piece at a time. In these two cases, he was now worried. The web might never be reconstructed. He went back to the reports. The detective began having trouble sleeping. Each morning, Yearling drove to work, took the elevator to the second floor, and for a moment, thought about these dead women. Richard Sanchez, just oh, painting the scene. He's like Bob Ross with words, man. He's just painting you a scene. He's, he's putting you in Yearling's head. What is he thinking? What is he feeling? What, how does this conflict drive him to be a better person? You know, it's, it's the building of a superhero, I'm telling you. I, this guy should write the next Batman. You know, if Richard Sanchez had written the last one, you wouldn't have had Batfleck turn it into Sadfleck. Get Richard Sanchez over to D.C. I want him on Suicide Squad 2. By the summer of 1981, Vincent Groves and his wife, Jeanette Hill, were arguing frequently. On August 14, 1981, the couple was fighting again. This time about a fishing trip Groves planned to take with two friends and their 17-year-old daughter, Tammy Sue Woodrum. Groves was taking a camper, which was attached to the bed of a pickup truck parked outside. Hill pleaded with him to allow her to come along, but Groves refused, grabbed the keys to the truck, and said he'd be back. The next morning, Hill was home sick from work when Groves appeared at the house. He had something to tell her, but he wouldn't do it there. He needed to tell her in the mountains. Did he have sex with the teenage girl? Was their marriage over? Hill walked outside and waited for an explanation. Groves told her to get in the truck, which was still connected to the camper. She complied, and Groves started the engine, pulling away from the house. He was silent as he drove toward the foothills. He finally made a turn onto a meandering country road near the town of Deckers. By then, it seemed to Hill that they'd been driving forever. Somewhere outside the town, Groves finally began to speak, and then he started to cry. The fishing trip with the friends was true, he told Hill, but first he picked up Woodrum, and the two went to Boulder to score some cocaine. When they'd gotten the stash, they drove toward Fraser, about 90 miles away, and pulled off the road. One thing led to another, Groves said, and the girl started shooting up, but she couldn't handle it. Something had gone wrong. She overdosed. She was dead. Hill wanted to jump out of the truck and run. The girl, where was the girl? Groves looked at his wife. The teenager's body, he said, was in the camper. Back in March 2010, Anthony Parisi had applied for a grant, solving cold cases with DNA from the National Institute of Justice, which had been approved in September of the same year. In 2011, Denver Police's cold case unit sorted through 600 post-mortem kits and reopened 266 unsolved homicide investigations from 1970 to 1984. Parisi immediately started reviewing cases and gathered mental notes on others. One in particular caught his attention, the rape and strangulation of Joyce Ramey, a 23-year-old prostitute from Denver. Her body was discovered on July 4, 1979, in a field near the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, northeast of town. She'd been sexually assaulted and strangled. Although Ramey was white and lived a high-risk lifestyle, the year and manner of death were identical to both the Cuff and Jennifer murders. Like Cuff, Ramey's body had been dumped. The sergeant delivered the file to Yearling's desk. Inside were photographs of Ramey's body, hands above her head, legs stretched out. Yearling opened the file and studied the photos. Bruises and scrapes covered her calves, her back, her right buttocks, her hip, and her neck. 
blood soaked the back of her head. It looked like Raimi fought like hell. On her left ring finger was a white metal ring with a blue stone. Yearling turned to his computer and pulled up a map. The site where Raimi's body was dumped, an area southeast of 56th Avenue and Havana Street, was now a jumble of loading docks and strips of asphalt and concrete. The detective typed Raimi's name into a Google search. After a few minutes clicking through different websites, Yearling stumbled upon a message board devoted to cold case investigations. In one comment thread dedicated to unsolved Colorado homicides, he found a simple who, what, when on a young woman who disappeared in August 1979. Her name was Norma Jean Halford. Yearling scrolled down the page and found a copied and pasted 21-year-old newspaper story that included Ramey's name on a list of women who were murdered or disappeared across the Denver metro area from 1979 to 1988. According to police at the time, the story said, one man might have been responsible, a man named Vincent Groves. At his wife's urging, Groves turned himself in to Lakewood Police and eventually was convicted of second-degree murder after his Tammy Sue Woodrum drug overdose story fell apart. Forensic evidence showed Woodrum had been beaten, raped, and strangled. In court, evidence proved that Woodrum was drug-free when she was killed. Prosecutors showed marks on the teenager's skin matched Groves' belt. Groves was sentenced to 12 years in prison in the summer of 1982. Between teaching classes to inmates and taking college classes of his own, Groves received intermittent prison visits from his wife, who asked for a confession. Groves refused, and she soon filed for divorce. By 1985, she was finally free. And she dodged a bullet, man. I mean, this guy's already killed how many people that no one even knows about? When was it going to be her turn? At some point, it would have been her turn. He wouldn't have been able to hold back from killing her, or she would have found out what he was doing. Something would have happened, and this lady would have been dead. It was just a matter of time. So, <clears throat> she left him in 1985. Two years later, on February 13th, 1987, Groves was released from prison under mandatory parole. He'd served five years when he arrived back in Denver, where he discovered that his family still supported him. His father gave him a blue 1978 AMC Concorde, and Groves worked for a time as a church janitor, then as a department store janitor. The work kept him moving through the Mile High City, often late at night, and he quickly reacquainted himself with life on East Colfax Avenue. Groves frequently drove a strip between York Street and an area just beyond the Denver city limits, a mishmash of drive-up motels, drug dealers, and booze spots. Booze spots. Why, why wouldn't you just say liquor stores? He, he hung out around liquor stores. Booze spots. Is this Prohibition era? Is he going to a speakeasy? Anyway, prostitutes took notice of Groves' Concord, and he moved among the women with ease. In March of 1987, he picked up a 20-something prostitute named Sheila Washington, who was working an area near Colfax. Groves offered her $200, which he planned to pay with 10 $20 bills he said he'd want at the dog track. Washington agreed. Before they went to her motel, they bought $100 in crack cocaine. Groves paid. And really, guys, gentlemen... If you're picking up your date for $200 and escorting her back to the motel, the chivalrous thing to do, of course, is to make sure you pay for the crack. You don't want to let the lady pick up the bill. It's just like a restaurant or a movie. If you're taking her out, whether it's a meal, a movie, or some crack, you pay. Okay? This guy was a gentleman. He knew to pay for the lady's crack. Inside room 8 at the El Patio Motel on Colfax, Grove stripped down to his boxers and Washington began to remove her clothes. He told her to stop at her bra and panties. He liked to take those off himself, he said. As he sat on the bed later, he watched Washington take hits from a crack pipe and said he wanted to show her how he used to get high in college. It was easy, Groves told her. Take a hit, hold it in, close your eyes, and count to 30. Washington put the pipe to her lips and took a drag. She held her breath. Then, slowly, she began to close her eyes. Groves was now standing in front of her. He towered over the five-foot, three-inch woman. As Washington's lungs filled with smoke, Groves inched closer. 
Suddenly, she felt hands on her throat. Washington opened her eyes and screamed. He quickly overpowered her. She thrashed. One of her feet hit a glass coffee table in the room and it landed with a crash on the floor. Grove squeezed harder. Washington could feel herself losing consciousness. Her body was going limp, and then everything went dark. Once he discovered the name Vincent Groves, Yearling was certain he'd found the killer. In late September 2011, a cursory check of the internet, old newspaper clippings, and police files fueled his hunch. All he was missing was a DNA link between Joyce Ramey and his other two cases. Then he would need Vincent Groves' DNA. Yearling thought the last step would be easy enough. The detective plugged Groves' name into the Accurant database and began scrolling through information. The particulars were straightforward, name, date of birth, and an address. There was just one problem. A man staying in room 10 at the El Patio Motel heard the fight between Sheila Washington and Vincent Groves. He kicked open the woman's door. There, he saw Groves, half naked, standing over the prostitute. Groves threw on his khaki pants and furiously... A man staying in room 10 at the El Patio Motel heard the fight between Sheila and Vincent, kicking open the woman's door. There, he saw Groves, half naked, standing over the prostitute. Groves threw on his khaki pants and furiously gathered his other clothes. Washington pulled herself off the floor, grabbed a broom, and chased Groves out the door and toward a sidewalk. Is that really how you're, you're chasing him out like you found a rat while you were cleaning the kitchen? Chased him out with a broom? Should have stabbed this motherfucker, right? The guy was just trying to kill you and you're going to chase him out with a broom? I mean, on the spot. Knife to the neck. Anyway. About a week later, she called Aurora and Denver police to report the assault, but she didn't know Grove's name. A year later, in August 1988, Washington flagged down a police car when she saw her attacker driving his blue vehicle on East Colfax Avenue. An officer stopped Groves, but only questioned him briefly and then let him go, because, of course, the woman reporting this was a crack-abusing prostitute, so why listen to her, right? This, this guy only tried to kill her, and they have information that connects him to other dead women, but no, nah, just, you know what, who believes the, the crack horror down the block, right? Just ask him a few questions and let him go, because cops are fucking lazy and don't care about the underprivileged. Around the same time, 28 investigators from multiple jurisdictions had begun looking into nearly 20 unsolved murders they thought were connected to Groves. Most of the women were prostitutes, nearly all had been sexually assaulted and strangled. In some cases, Groves was the last person to be seen with the victims. In others, it was known that Groves supplied drugs to the women. During their investigations, police also learned of attacks on other prostitutes, including the one on Sheila Washington. On September 1, 1988, police arrested Groves near the corner of South Colorado Boulevard and East Mexico Avenue on an attempted first-degree murder charge in the Washington case. As part of the arrest, investigators also wanted to question Groves about the series of unsolved murders. Police interviewed his parents, his new girlfriend, and his ex-wife, among others. His vehicle was taken to an auto repair shop where it was searched and vacuumed. Officers collected hairs they found in the car. During an interview with investigators that stretched on past midnight, Groves told police Washington had stolen $1,600 from him. He never tried to choke her, he contended. When an investigator asked about the slew of dead women, Groves admitted he knew many of them. He identified a prostitute he'd been with, claimed he knew the killer of one woman, and looked at a photo of another victim stating, you've done your homework, it looks real bad for me. Prosecutors tried to introduce details of eight murders before Groves' attempted murder trial began in Denver District Court in 1989, thinking in part the unsolved strangulation deaths could help show a pattern leading up to the Washington attack. A judge rejected the motion. During his trial, Groves' attorney said his client tussled with Washington, but there wasn't physical evidence that he tried to strangle her. He argued that prosecutors based their entire case on claims from a drug-using prostitute who'd by then been sentenced to three years in prison for cocaine possession. As far as the defense attorney was concerned, this was a run-of-the-mill assault that shouldn't have made it out of county court. 
The case against Groves fell apart, and on February 16th, it took a jury only 90 minutes to acquit him. He was hardly cleared, though. The earlier multi-jurisdictional investigation netted other cases. In Adams County, investigators linked Groves' DNA pattern to a 19-year-old prostitute named Juanita Lovato, whose naked body was found in April 1988 in a field near Strasburg, east of Denver. In Douglas County, Groves was charged with the murder of a 25-year-old prostitute named Diane Mancera, whose body was dumped a year earlier along I-25 just west of Parker, Colorado. DNA banding found in the women's underwear matched the pattern in Groves' DNA structure. The two cases became bellwethers for forensic evidence in Colorado. Groves was convicted in both cases in 1990 and sentenced to life. He was already in poor health. He had hepatitis C and suffered from chronic liver problems. In 1996, his body began to shut down. Groves was moved in and out of hospitals, and in fall that year, Lakewood police interviewed him, asking about the death uh, in 1987 of Zebra Mason, or sorry, uh, asking about the 1987 death of Zavra Mason, a 19-year-old former honors student from Denver who was due for a job interview the day she was found slumped in her vehicle in a field off West Colfax Avenue. Groves earlier admitted that his bank, Bank Western, was near where Mason's car was found. The investigators told Groves he could clear his conscience and give the young woman's family some closure. Whatever information he might have had, he clearly planned to take it to his grave. Groves died October 31, 1996, at University Hospital in Denver. He was 42 years old. I've been chasing a dead man, Yearling thought to himself. He stared at the computer screen on his desk. He couldn't believe it. Since he became a detective, Yearling had thought his career was leading to something monumental, that each new case had been like a mental exercise designed to build his investigative muscles. Petty crimes led to thefts, which led to assaults, which led to rapes, which led to cases like these. He'd been searching for a faceless murderer for the better part of 19 months, but now that he felt he was on the precipice of a resolution, he'd never get the satisfaction of seeing the man himself. He'd replayed the scene hundreds of times in his mind, the moment when he came face to face with the killer when he finally got to ask the one question that had bothered him since the day he opened those files. Why did you do it? So, I mean, there, uh, Richard Sanchez, man, I want this guy to write my eulogy. I want him to write my biography. Uh, I mean, he's playing it like, like yearlings, just taxi, uh, taxi driver style, just looking in the mirror. Why'd you do it? Why did you do it? Why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? just getting ready he's like I'm gonna get this fucker and the guy's already dead and you could always dig him up and kick him in the face right cut his balls off something I mean if you really want vengeance it can be had you just gotta dig the fucker up despite the setback the detective kept chasing Groves if only on paper and in the laboratory he still needed to clear the cases Yearling emailed the Colorado Bureau of Investigation on September 17, 2011 and requested Groves' DNA profile through the federal database. It didn't exist. Groves had died just before DNA screening became mandatory. Yearling considered his options. From another online search, he learned Groves' father and a brother had died within the past decade. That left one surviving brother. From previous cases, Yearling knew a male sibling's DNA was admissible in court as a stand-in for the suspect. Or perhaps Yearling could just get a judge's order to exhume his body, wherever it was buried. But there was another option. From reading through his files, Yearling knew Grove's DNA existed somewhere as part of his previous murder convictions. On October 5, 2011, Yearling and Anthony Parisi met with the police and sheriff's investigators from Aurora. Yearling asked if anyone was working on a Groves-related case that might include DNA evidence. Nothing was active, the investigators told him, but something suggested that Lakewood police might have saved Groves' DNA profile from the 1981 Tammy Sue Woodrum murder. Yearling called Lakewood immediately. A sergeant there tracked down Groves' decades-old DNA report and said he'd email it over. Yearling printed the email and raced back to his cubicle. 
He pulled the suspect DNA profile that connected the Peggy Cuff and Emma Jennifer cases and set it on his desk next to the Lakewood report. Yearling's eyes darted among the pages. Because the write-ups were done by different labs 30 years apart, they weren't exactly alike, but he had worked with enough DNA cases that he could figure out at least a portion of the jumbled coding. One set of numbers, one match. Another set of numbers, another match. More numbers, more matches. About halfway through the reports, Yearling stopped, grabbed a yellow highlighter, and went back to the papers. Match, highlight, match, highlight, match, highlight. He jumped up, rushed down the hall to the elevator, and pushed a button for the sixth floor crime laboratory. When the doors opened, Parisi was walking around the corner. The two nearly ran into each other. To the sergeant, it looked as if Yearling had just matched a winning lotto ticket. The detective waved several pieces of paper in the air. Parisi trusted Yearling's instincts, he said, but he too wanted confirmation from the lab. Yearling waited a couple minutes outside the crime laboratory's doors, but it felt like an hour. An analyst finally showed up, took the papers, and studied them for a few moments. The lab would have to do its own examination, the analyst said, but the coding appeared to match. Yearling had just solved the cases. The detective smiled, walked back to the hallway, and wanted to scream. Yearling couldn't wait for the elevator to come. He ran four flights of stairs back to the cold case unit and stopped in the doorway of Parisi's office. The sergeant was sitting behind his desk. Yearling held the pieces of paper to the sides of his face and smiled. We got him. Several months later, the police lab officially confirmed the DNA match between Vincent Groves and DNA found in the Cuff and Jennifer cases. In January of that year, the lab connected DNA in Joyce Ramey's case to Groves, a link Parisi had called months earlier. Yearling, meanwhile, investigated the death of a 35-year-old prostitute named Pamela Montgomery, who was strangled and dumped in a North Denver alley in the early morning hours of August 14, 1988. There was no suspect DNA in her case, but a witness at the time told police he heard a poorly tuned vehicle in the alley behind his home, then saw a tall black man pull a body out of the car. Shortly after Grove's AMC Concord was impounded following his arrest in the summer of 1988, the witness in Montgomery's case was taken to the auto repair shop where it was stored. The witness vaguely recognized the car, and he asked to hear the engine. It made a distinct chugging sound identical to the one in the alley. On February 9th, 2012, the Denver District Attorney's Office cleared all four cases. Including his previous convictions, Groves officially had been connected to seven murders. How many more women died at his hands was a question Parisi and Yearling knew they would never answer. The 1988 investigation suspected Groves of at least a dozen more cases that remained unsolved. Perhaps most frightening was that Peggy Cuff and Emma Jennifer never even showed up on that list. Yearling and Parisi reached out to the victims' families. Only Pamela Montgomery's family failed to respond. On Valentine's Day that year, the two men put on their suits and spent the day meeting with the families inside a second-floor conference room at police headquarters. The room overlooked a parking lot and a few bail bond shops. Yearling and Parisi sat across a large rectangular table from the relatives and were joined by a representative from the Denver District Attorney's Office and a victim's advocate from the police department. The men explained the cold case unit's work over the past few years and told mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers about Vincent Groves. For Joyce Ramey's family, the information was hardly a surprise. Groves had been linked to that murder for decades, though the woman's parents seemed relieved that there was finally confirmation. Yearling and Parisi called Peggy Cuff's brother, who lived outside the state. Yearling spoke into the conference room phone. We wanted to let you know that we didn't give up, he told the man. The last meeting was with Emma Jennifer's sister. She never expected the news. Yearling and Parisi could see the confusion on her face. What brought Groves into her sister's life? Why did he choose her? There were no answers. After the meeting, Parisi returned to his office. The day had been among the most emotionally draining of his career, and he realized just how profoundly the cases affected him. Parisi had come to know them as Peggy and Emma and Joyce, and now Pamela. But as he stood alone in his office, he felt empty. 
On his desk was a three-ring binder with file numbers connected to hundreds of unsolved cases. More victims, more police reports, and more confused families. Parisi wanted to solve them all, but knew that was an impossibility. Yearling went home and took his wife to dinner. He rarely explained the details of his work to her. He thought the day-to-day -day of investigating rapes and murders was too grisly for someone who didn't deal with it regularly. Even in this case, perhaps the greatest triumph of his career, he kept the information to a minimum and instead told his wife he loved her. Months after news reports of Yearling's work made their way around the world, the detective continued to think about the women. Even with the uncertainty over the years, the agonizing stops and starts to the investigation, Yearling couldn't get over the feeling that he'd been blessed, blessed to be a police detective, blessed with the opportunity to solve those murders, blessed with the chance to sit across from the families. Yearling was now 43 years old, and he'd begun to think the Groves case was perhaps not the one that he'd imagined his career was leading toward. Instead, it was just one in a series of hundreds he hoped to solve in his lifetime. Each no more important than the last, the last no more important than the first. But still, he couldn't help but think there was something special about the Groves investigation, something intrinsically valuable about that chase. He had never been more certain that his job was his fate. After all, it was right there in Yearling's case file on Groves, a black and white affirmation that perhaps his mother was right. He was meant to be a light in the darkness. Because the day after Vincent Groves died 16 years ago, was Yearling's first class at the police academy. So Groves dies Halloween, 1996, October 31st, November 1st, Yearling shows up for police academy. I mean, that's, oh my God, that's, that's almost, that, they would say that's written in the stars, that it was karma, it was fate, it was destiny. I mean, you've got everything you need here for an epic, comic book like superhero book or a movie i mean it's just richard sanchez uh, this article did win an award i don't know what kind probably like some local denver or state award but man he deserved it that was well written it it sucked you in and kept you there you know uh, and I did some extra investigating. I didn't just read this article. And what I was able to find out was, well, uh, Vincent Groves is currently suspected of killing 24 women. And that is why he, he gets the, the recognition as the most prolific serial killer in Colorado history. Uh, at least two dozen women have been tied to him. It doesn't sound like they're actively pursuing closing the cases, but just what they have, you know, strangled, raped, prostitute, dumped, at least 24 women. Uh, but since his time in prison, uh, Colorado state law has changed. Uh, under current Colorado law, that original second degree conviction for the murder of Woodrum would have been a minimum sentence of 16 years, 12 of which would have to be served before being eligible for parole. That would have put Groves getting out in about 1994 at the very earliest and probably would have reduced the amount of time he had to kill again. Um, but, I mean, who's to say? Had he gone to prison for that long, he wouldn't have been out drinking and smoking crack and, and getting diseases and running his health into the ground. So he could have been out sometime in 16 to 48 years and, and killed again. Who knows? It, it's hard to speculate. So I always say... Prepare for the worst and don't hope for anything, you know? We're all fucked from the start and bad things are going to happen regardless. Uh, like, like, dude, in Friday the 13th, you're all doomed, doomed. And that is the story of Vincent Groves, Colorado's most prolific serial killer. And that means it's time for five fast facts about death. One. 80% of deaths in the U.S. occur in hospitals. Two, one in 200,000 high school age athletes die every year, usually from unsuspected heart disease. Three, 18% of resuscitated patients in a Netherlands study reported an out-of-body experience. Four, 
The average cremation uses a little over 13 gallons of fuel to reduce a body to ash. 5. The standard for embalming a body is 1 gallon of embalming fluid for every 50 pounds of person. Alright, so from prostitute murderer Vincent Groves, we move on uh, to a story you guys have probably heard about. Uh, usually I try not to do really popular stories. I try to find things that are a little more offbeat. Uh, the, the Colorado cannibal Alfred Packer. Uh, I've seen it spelled Alfred and Alfred, but I've only ever heard it pronounced Alfred. So we're going to call him Alfred Packer, not Alfred Packer. Uh, like I said, you probably recognize the name. He's the Colorado cannibal. Troma Films released a movie back in the day titled Cannibal the Musical. Uh, which was based loosely on Alfred Packer and created by Trey Parker of South Park fame. But what was the real story of Alfred Packer? The truth is, we'll never really know. He was the only one that made it back from the trip, so we only have his word to go on, and, I mean, just a, a little bit of forensic evidence, most of which was collected over a 100 years after the fact. But this is the details as we think we know them, uh, taken from Colorado Life magazine, written by Matt Masick or Masich, Masich, I'm not sure, M-A-I-S-C-H, however that's pronounced. Government official Charles Adams summoned Alfred G. Packer to his office on the Los Pinos Indian Agency, determined to find out what really happened to Packer's five traveling companions. I believe these men are dead and you know something about it, Adams said. You might as well tell the truth. If the matter is as I suspect, you're more to be pitied than blamed. Several minutes passed. Packer said nothing. Three months earlier, in February 1874, the lanky, blue-eyed 31-year-old was one of six gold prospectors to venture into southwest Colorado's San Juan Mountains during one of the worst winters in memory. They were headed for the Indian Agency south of present-day Gunnison, but Packer was the only one who arrived. Though he claimed the rest of his party left him behind after his feet got too frozen to keep up, rumors soon spread that he had murdered his comrades for their money. Perhaps feeling cornered by Adam's interrogation, Packer finally broke his silence with a cryptic, disturbing observation. It would not be the first time that people had been obliged to eat each other when they were hungry. And so, through tears, Packer began to confess. It was to be the first of many confessions. He would recount his story a number of times over the next three decades, with the details changing in each telling. To this day, no one knows if Packer was blameless, uh, just a victim to blizzards and starvation, or a calculating murderer who led five men to their doom. But there is one detail that was the same in each confession. He survived more than a month in the frozen wilderness by eating human flesh. Alfred G. Packer was a cannibal. Packer was born near Pittsburgh on November 21st, 1842, though he claimed his birthday was January 21st. This ambiguity is a hallmark of Packer's life. There are two stories for even the most basic details, including his name. The spelling was Alfred in all official documents and contemporary newspapers, but he repeatedly signed his name, Alfred. He left his parents, brother, and two sisters at a young age, and by his late teens, he was living as a shoemaker in Minnesota. I know why he, why he said his birthday was different. I, I do this all the time. You, you come across a new restaurant you want to try out, and you sign up for the birthday club, so they'll send you the coupon in your email for the free dessert, but, you know, your birthday is not for another six months. So when you go onto the website and you sign up, oh, I'm going to tell them my birthday is three days from now. And then you get the coupon and you can go in and get the free lava cake uh, with the little clappy song and stuff. And it's not even your birthday. That's what's going on here. It was probably like it was January 18th. They were going to go to Applebee's and he was like, oh, I got to get that, that lava cake. So he signed up real quick with, with January 21st as his birthday when he was really born on November 21st. All his life, Packer suffered from epilepsy, a disorder then thought to be linked to insanity. He enlisted with two different Union regiments during the Civil War, but he served with each for less than a year before getting discharged due to seizures, which occurred every two days, if not more frequently. 
He spent the decade after the war drifting from job to job. Hunter, hard rock miner, trapper, teamster, guide. But despite his various explanations for his seizures, his employment invariably ended when his ailment manifested itself. By 1872, Packer arrived in Colorado. He worked as a miner in Georgetown, where he lost part of his left pinky and index finger to an errant sledgehammer blow. He wandered to Utah in 1873, making a poor living at the mines there. Then came word of a new gold strike in Colorado, and a group of would-be gold hunters, strangers to one another, gathered in Bingham Canyon, Utah, eager to get the first crack at the untapped riches in the San Juan Mountains. Among them was Packer, who touted his experience traveling the mountains of Colorado. Another man on the trip, Preston Nutter, summed up the general opinion of Packer. He was sulky, obstinate, and quarrelsome. He was a petty thief willing to take things that did not belong to him, whether of any value or not. Whether Packer actually did anything to warrant this assessment is unknown, but the stigma of his epilepsy might have contributed to the mistrust. He suffered fits while still in Utah. Once, while sitting by the campfire, he was overcome by a seizure and fell into the flames, overturning a coffee pot which spattered its scalding contents on his face. The party, which grew to include 21 men, set out in late autumn on a long journey by foot to the Colorado border. The travel was slow, game was scarce, and early snow was heavy. Facing dwindling rations, the crew was forced to eat livestock feed. By late January 1874, the bedraggled lot made it to the Ute Indian camp of Chief Oray in Colorado, near present-day Delta. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong. O-U-R-A-Y, Oray, I assume. Oray shared his food and fire with the white men. He knew the country as well as anyone, and he warned his guests that to venture into the mountains at this time of year was to risk certain death. No Ute would attempt such a passage until spring. But some of the party of 21 refused to wait for better weather. Seeing there was no stopping them, Oray gave them directions. Travel east for seven days to the government cattle camp near Gunnison. Then follow the creek south to the Los Pinos Indian Agency, from which it would be a relatively easy 40-mile trek to Sagwatch. Yeah, relatively easy 40-mile trip. Oh, yeah, it's just 40 miles through the woods and the mountains. Yeah, no no sweat, dude. No problem. Just 40 miles through the snow. You're good. My God, people were so hardcore back then. I am a pussy. I mean, even by modern standards, let alone compared to, to these kind of people. They're like, oh, I was starving in the woods and four-foot snow drift, so I bit a bear in the throat and drank his blood. Kind of, oh, my God. I I just, I am so glad I live in this era because I would have been totally useless at any other time. Like before 1987, like I was born in 82 and I wasn't even useful until technology caught up like in the late 80s, early 90s. I I could not be one of these guys that, uh, well, uh, no shoes, we'll uh, we'll tie squirrels to our feet and walk a hundred miles. No. I'm the guy who sits there and waits for everybody else to get back. Where were we? 40 40 mile trek to Sogwatch. Uh, Okay. Packer was the nominal guide for the group of six that departed February 9th. With him were George Noon, a teenager, Israel Swan, older than 60 and rumored to be carrying thousands in cash, James Humphrey, Frank Miller, a butcher from Germany, and a stout, red-faced, red-haired Shannon Wilson Bell. They were almost immediately lost. The relentless snow fell so deep they had to travel along the ridges rather than the gulches they'd planned on following. After nine days, they ate their final pint of flour, which he said they mixed with melted snow to make a sort of mush. A few days later, Noon offered his pair of goatskin moccasins to eat. They plucked out the hair, roasted, and ate them. Every few days, they'd eat another man's moccasins until there were none left. They soon ran out of matches, so they marched with burning coals in a coffee pot, which Old Man Swan volunteered to carry to keep his hands warm. He was suffering the worst from the cold. 
They forged ahead, an ever-growing blanket of snow making it impossible to retrace their steps. They ate rosebud from wild rose bushes and chewed pine gum to allay their hunger, but it wasn't working. They cried and shouted and prayed in their desperate hunger. They prayed most of all for the taste of salt. Coming to a frozen lake, they punched a hole through the ice to catch some fish, but they found only muck. By day 20 of their supposed seven-day trip, the exhausted swan could go no further. The famished frozen men followed the lake fork of the Gunnison River to a pine-shaded gulch near a plateau, places now known as Dead Man's Gulch and Cannibal Plateau. On April 16th, a well-fed packer stumbled out of the woods and onto the Indian Agency. He ran into Preston Nutter and other members of the original Utah party who had waited out the winter in a raised camp. Like Packer, they were just arriving at the agency. But unlike him, they'd had a relatively easy 14-day trip. Packer rode a stagecoach with some of them to the town of Sogwatch, and they naturally wondered what became of his companions. Packer claimed they had left him behind, forcing him to survive on rosebuds and small game on his solitary journey. But his Utah acquaintances grew suspicious once they reached Sogwatch. Packer was thought to be nearly penniless, so how did he get the money for a new horse and saddle when he hit town? How could he afford his current drinking and card playing spree in a local saloon? Packer spent two weeks living it up in Sogwatch before Charles Adams, the man in charge of the Los Pinos Indian Agency, talked him into returning to the agency to lead a search party for the missing men. Adams asked Packer where he'd gotten his money, and Packer said he borrowed it from a local blacksmith. Adams soon discovered that was a lie and urged Packer to come clean, prompting his first and least truthful confession. It was late in the evening of May 4th that Packer began spinning his tail. They were lost, he told Adams, and old man Swan died of hunger. The party cut meat from his body and traveled on for a few more days until the death of Humphrey, who was also eaten. Days later, Packer went off to gather firewood, returning to find Miller had been killed by the two remaining men. Bell later killed Noon, and later still, he tried to club Packer with his rifle, but missed, breaking it against a tree. Packer shot and killed Bell, took a large hunk of his body for food, and kept hiking. Adams was inclined to believe Packer's story and authorized a search for the bodies. Packer was the guide, and Nutter and the other members of the Utah group followed. But after a few days of looking, Packer claimed he couldn't find the route he traveled. You killed these men and you ought to be hung for it, an enraged Nutter said to Packer. Packer was arrested and kept under constant guard in a building on the Sogwatch County Sheriff's Ranch. But months passed, and with no bodies found, no evidence of a crime, and no specific charges against Packer, the authorities weren't thrilled about his indefinite detention at taxpayer expense. Someone slipped Packer a pen knife to open the locks on his shackles, and the cannibal disappeared into the night. It wasn't long after Packer's escape that a traveling illustrator for Harper's Weekly discovered a grisly scene on the banks of the Lake, of lake Fork in Gunnison near present-day Lake City. Five dead and butchered men lay on the ground, each with his head bashed in by a hatchet except for one man who had no head at all. The artist sketched the corpses, which had apparently been there for months before alerting authorities. All agreed they were a nasty, bad-smelling mess to handle, said a man who arrived at the scene. Nutter was summoned to confirm what everyone suspected. Here, at last, were Packer's companions. But where was Packer? Jean Frenchy Cabazon was one of the party of 21 from Utah who wisely stayed in Array's camp for the winter. Nine years later, in 1883, he was working as a peddler in the mining camps of Wyoming. One day, he met a familiar-looking miner calling himself John Schwartz, who wanted to buy supplies. Cabazon had to stifle his surprise when he realized he knew this man with long chestnut hair and a high, grating voice. But he wasn't called Schwartz when they first met. He was called Packer. Cabazon alerted the local sheriff and Packer was arrested. Charles Adams, by then a postal inspector in Manitou Springs, that's right down the road, Manitou Springs, 
That's where you gotta go, like Colorado Springs, remember how I told you we don't have recreational marijuana? The closest town is the next one over, Manitou Springs, where they will sell you marijuana for $24 a gram, which is like five or six times the price any other place. But they're the only game in town for multiple towns around. So, uh, just, I don't know why I give you this information. I know you don't want it. Uh, probably half the people was like, ah, fucking pothead Colorado. Yeah, sorry. I just, I don't know. Manitou Springs. I didn't know. I didn't know Manitou Springs was involved in this story. That's like, that's right out the backyard, you know, a few miles down the road. Charles Adams, a postal inspector in Manitou Springs by now, was called to Cheyenne to confirm Packer's identity and accompany him back to Denver by train where a thousand curious onlookers gathered on March 16th, 1883 for the cannibal's arrival. Packer, looking haggard in brown overalls and a soiled woolen shirt, was glad to see Adams again. He had drifted to Arizona, Montana, and Oregon before coming to Wyoming, he said, and he felt fate had drawn him to Adams so he could finally tell the whole truth. That night, Packer gave Adams his second confession. The other five men hadn't gradually died along the way, Packer admitted. They all made it to Dead Man's Gulch, where the others set up camp while Packer climbed the mountain to get a better vantage of which way to go. Packer took a gun with him in case he saw any animals to shoot for food. He was gone most of the day, and when he returned, he saw his comrades lying in their blankets, except for Bell, who was sitting by the campfire. When Bell noticed he was back, he charged at Packer, wielding a hatchet. I shot him sideways through the belly, Packer said. He fell on his face, the hatchet fell forward. I grabbed it and hit him in the top of his head. The other men didn't stir. Bell had hacked them all to death. Packer saw that Bell had been roasting a piece of meat cut from the leg of Miller, the German butcher. Packer camped there that night and set out the next day, but snow forced him back. He made a shelter of pine boughs not far from the dead men, then fetched the meat Bell had cut off. He searched the bodies, taking $70 he found, far less than the thousands he was suspected of taking. Packer made a fire at his new camp, cooked the hunk of Miller's leg, and ate it. He was sickened by it, so he only ate a bit at a time. I tried to get away every day but could not, so I lived off the flesh of these men. The bigger part of 60 days I was out. If this was true, Adams asked, why hadn't Packer told him so nine years ago? I was excited. I wanted to say something, Packer said, and the story as I told it came first to my mind. The Denver newspapers had a field day with the story. Articles about Packer described as the man-eating murderer with his villainous and ugly face carried headlines like human jerked beef and a fiend who became very corpulent. Wait, that's, ah, God, that's such an old school insult, right? Like if you called someone a fiend today who became very corpulent, they wouldn't even know what the hell those words meant. They wouldn't even know you were insulting them. We, we don't talk like this anymore. This is such old-timey speak. Plus, we're all stupid now from, from texting and, and LOL and BRB and all this shit. Like, a fiend who became very corpulent. Uh, so great. I love old-school insults. In the decades since Packer's ordeal, the mining town of Lake City had sprouted up a few miles from Dead Man's Gulch, and Packer was transported there for trial. On April 9th, a heavily monocled packer was led into a courtroom with a pot-bellied stove, chandelier, and a no-spitting sign. See, cracking down on tobacco even back then, no spitting, and then soon no smoking and no talking. Could you vape? Even if you weren't allowed to spit, did they still let you vape? Prosecutors argued Packer deliberately led his companions into the wilderness so he could murder them and take their money, even before the trial started. That was exactly what most of the jurors believed had happened. Packer defended himself with a rambling, at times incoherent statement. He freely admitted killing Bell, but only after Bell had killed the rest out of insanity. The jury didn't believe him. Packer was convicted of premeditated murder, and in a long, eloquent statement, Judge Melville Gary sentenced him to death by hanging. Close up your ears to the blandishments of hope, he said. 
Listen not to its flattering promises of life, but prepare for the dread certainty of death. Saloon keeper Larry Dolan, who had been watching in the gallery and rushed back to his bar after the sentencing, came up with a cheeky alternate version of the judge's speech that is often repeated as the actual sentence. There were seven Democrats in Hinsdale County, but you, you voracious man-eating son of a bitch, you ate five of them. I sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you're dead, dead, dead as a warning against reducing the Democratic population of the state. I don't... Was this guy like the original 4chan or something? The judge is just like, hey, you killed some people, you're going to die now. And then this dude turns it into a, a, a Democrat versus Republican kind of thing. Getting like really, really political there. I, I guess I don't get it. Like, What was the point in that? Packer was taken back to Lake City Jail. While awaiting his fate, a minor arrested for drunkenness balked at his infamous cellmate. Packer the man-eater is in that cell, and I'm damned if I'm going to stay here, the miner protested. Packer, his sense of humor intact, warned him, Dry up out there, goddamn you, or I'll chew you up. The petrified drunk didn't say another word. Packer was spared the noose. His lawyer discovered that the murder statute on the books in 1874 had been repealed and replaced without a savings clause, a technicality that meant Packer couldn't be prosecuted for murder. The technicality didn't get him off the hook for manslaughter, however, so he was retried in Gunnison and convicted of the lesser crime and sentenced to 40 years in prison, the maximum eight years for each dead man. Packer expected this, but made a curious request of the judge. He wanted to be sentenced to 40 years, but only for the death of Bell, the one man he admitted to killing. The request was denied. Packer considered himself dead to the world in 1886 as he began serving his sentence at the penitentiary in Canyon City, but he never stopped seeking exoneration. His efforts were reported by the newspapers, attracting the notice of Dwayne Hatch, a young Denver barber. As a teenager, Hatch sought his fortune in Wyoming, where he was befriended by a stranger who invited him to share his camp and work with him on a cattle ranch. He recognized the cannibal in the newspaper as his friend and benefactor. Hatch visited Packer in prison, where they resumed their friendship. He found Packer nothing like the vicious killer he'd been portrayed to be. He was a model prisoner who spent his time gardening and braiding horsehair into watch fobs and belts to sell to visitors. Packer, using funds from his venture and his Civil War veteran's pension, gave money to paroled prisoners so they could buy respectable clothes and pay for a month's rent while seeking work, and he never expected repayment. Packer is the soul of generosity and apparently cares nothing for money, the prison warden said of him. Strange for a man convicted of killing five men for their money. Hatch spent the next decade seeking a pardon for Packer, hiring some of the best lawyers in Denver. When customers came in for a shave and a haircut, Hatch asked them to sign a petition supporting Packer's release. Eventually, the public came to believe Packer was indeed a victim of circumstance convicted on flimsy circumstantial evidence. Enterprising Denver Post reporter Polly Pry took up the banner, and by the dawn of the 20th century, most of Denver's civic and business leaders joined her in pestering Governor Charles Thomas to pardon the state's most notorious inmate. The pressure worked. Before Thomas left office in January 1901, his last official act was to parole, but not pardon, Packer. The cannibal and the governor reached a gentleman's agreement that Packer wouldn't seek to profit from his notoriety. Packer got a job as a security guard at the Denver Post, but spent most of his remaining years prospecting in the foothills southwest of Denver. He died in obscurity on April 24, 1907, still longing to clear his name. Packer's story took on a new life after his death in 1907. Republicans in the 1930s founded the Packer Club of Colorado, a playful nod to Packer's supposed eating of five Democrats. Students at the University of Colorado in Boulder eat at the Alfred Packer Restaurant and Grill, dedicated in 1968. And before Trey Parker created South Park, he produced the cult classic film Cannibal the Musical, in which he played a singing Alfred Packer. Forensic experts still investigate the case and come to conflicting conclusions. 
In 1989, a team led by law professor James Stars exhumed the skeletons of Packer's comrades, buried at Dead Man's Gulch. Analysis of the bones showed defensive cut wounds as well as knife marks indicating defleshing. Stars came away believing Packard was indeed the murderer. More recently, David Bailey, curator at Grand Junction's Museum of Western Colorado, tracked down a Colt revolver found at the Packard site with three of its five chambers still loaded. Using an electron microscope, Bailey's team compared the samples from the lead in the pistol's bullets and the lead from soil beneath Bell's exhumed body. The samples matched, supporting Packer's claim that he shot Bell. <clears throat> and, I mean, I wish there was some big epic conclusion. Some, you know, somebody found out the truth and now we know, but we don't. That's, that's pretty much it. And that's the story of Alfred Packer, or at least we think it is. Um, you know, I, I wish this story had some epic conclusion that I could give you that, oh, they found out the truth and here's what the real deal was, but we'll never know. Forensic science back then wasn't what it is now. Uh, it's been too long to collect any kind of use, useful evidence at this point, and we only have one guy's story. So it's just one of those things we're never really gonna, gonna know the truth about. And that's our two tales from Colorful Colorado. What did we learn? Don't get cancerous organs put into your body. Don't take a ride from anyone on Colfax, but if you do, make them buy you some crack. And don't go into the mountains in the snow. Donner party, anyone? Donner party? Thanks for hanging out with me again, guys. Uh, I hope I'm getting better at this thing. Uh, listens seem to be going up each episode, so I guess that means I'm doing something right. Uh, the show is No Better Death on uh, Facebook, Gmail, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever social media and podcasts are. The show is there under the name No Better Death. Uh, if that's too much to remember, just go to nobetterdeath.info for all info on No Better Death. Uh, and be sure to hit me up on Facebook or through email with any death-related stories you may have, your thoughts on death or dying, stories you want to hear me talk about on the show, whatever you got, send it in. The more you give me, the more I can give you. Also, I implore you to please, please, please leave a review on iTunes. Some kind of review, whether you like the show or don't. Just, you know, click click the stars, give your opinion. It helps get the show's ranking up so more people can find it. And I'd really like to get this out to as many people as possible. You know, the more listeners I get, the more emails and suggestions I'll get. So the more we can build up the show. Uh and make it more fun, make it a better thing to listen to, you know. Uh, I never stop trying to improve, uh, so please, uh, iTunes review if you would be so kind. Uh, I am Sick Grayson. Until next time, try not to die. Uh, I'm going to change the music up on you guys this episode, too, so let me know what you think about that. Later. Later.